Hello everyone who's come along to watch this vlog. This is vlog number nine uh, from Imagineer and today we have the pleasure of spending some time with uh, Francis Brown and John Dal Dalrymple. Uh, both Francis and John are really active in um, this area of work and this area of purpose in Scotland. And um, before we go into introducing Francis and John, just an introduction to Imagineers. So Imagineers is an organisation that's been around now for over 12 years. The purpose of the organisation is to really support people to be living a good life in their community in a way that makes sense to them. So we hear the terminology self-directed support, personalisation, person-centred planning. We aim to bring all that together under one roof and to be alongside people in the pursuance of a life that makes sense to them helping to make things happen and overcome barriers. And you will hear in the conversation that we have in the next hour and a half, that that is so closely connected to the work that Francis and John do as well. So we hope you enjoy the conversation. Um, it, we will tell you more about how to uh, get in touch with Imagineer and Radical Visions at the end of this uh, session, but let's introduce Francis and John. So. Francis I've known for a long time. We first met on a train journey back down to Leeds from Scotland many, many moons ago. Um, and I know that you've been so dedicated throughout your working life around making sure that support looks good, is good, and it works really well for people. And seeing support outside the lens of service land support and recognising that support comes in an abundance of ways mm. into people's lives. And John, we've met over recent years, especially through some of the um, um, activities at Citizen Network and some of the things that were happening in that space during lockdown. And I know that you've worked alongside Francis for a long time, but really come from that social work perspective as well and yep. recognising the fundamental role that social work has to play in helping people to get to a, a better space in life. And of course, Sarah's here who's um, co-director, Imagineer and trainer and support broker. So I think that set the scene, hasn't it, as to who we are. You haven't introduced yourself, Liz. Oh, that's true. <laughs> yes, I'm Liz. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Liz, the founder and also director at Imagineer as well. I've been active in doing person-centred planning and support brokerage for 20 plus years. I'll stop counting at some stage, but uh, I've been in this space for, for a long time. I think what, where, what, where would be really valuable to start is the name of your organisation, because for me, it, it, it's a really fantastic name and it really encapsulates what you're about. So just tell us a little bit around what motivated you to establish and set up Radical Visions. Okay. Who wants to start, John, do you? I'll, I'll start if you wish. Um, yeah, and I'll interrupt I, I any minute now. You, and that's how it goes. <laughs> that's, how, that's how it works. Uh, well, we, I, I can I can still remember sitting in a room in uh, the offices of Neighbourhood Networks in Glasgow, Francis and I scribbling away, coming up with names and discarding them and. Uh, trying others and then we brought some people from the office next door in eventually and tested tested one or two options out and Radical Visions was the one they really liked too and I suppose it our motivation in that sense comes from um, being involved in this work for a long time and seeing being influenced by wonderful people and ideas and seeing really positive things happen for people, but also fearing over the passage of time that perhaps um, things were going backwards or we were caught up in some circular thing where you felt you'd made progress and then uh, the progress was discarded or people forgot their own history. Um, mm. People forget the history of what, what has been achieved in the relatively recent past around deinstitutionalization and uh, working with one person at a time and, and be, really being personalized and person-centered. Uh, that had, We don't really know how to do that anymore and it's, it's very expensive. So 
some of some of the sense of being radical relates to hanging on to what was truly radical and mm -hmm. uh, we believe still is radical mm -hmm. if you get it right for people in terms of uh, yeah. valuing each person uh, fully as a as a person and having the kind of values and expectations that flow from that yeah. and, I suppose yeah. some of the things that that if you think about how long we've been around, John, yes, <laughs> as as Liz has said, you know, for herself as well, um, there's that experience of discovering radical ideas, and that probably happened for us a long, long time ago. People might think that when we talk about radical visions, it's because we're sitting saying we're coming up with some new concepts or new ideas, but actually. There is the, really what we wanted to do was hold on to the radical view. Mm -hmm. uh, if, when I think back, when John and I were doing um, the work around In Control Scotland and establishing that in Scotland, In Control Scotland's view of self-directed support was um, a total transformation of the social care system into a system of self-directed support, which meant that the, the system changes completely we're not talking about working around the edges here we're not talking mm -hmm. about you know um, you might get it if you live in a certain area or if a certain provider decides to do something different the whole point of that was completely radical change mm -hmm. and the work that we were doing at that time was about really trying to transform the whole system and that includes mm -hmm. thinking about community and thinking about it doesn't stop with a system change it stops with a whole turning so much of what exists on its head um mm -hmm. so that people actually you know you have to think about community and develop community for all of that to work and mm -hmm. i have to say that even as t as time went on that radical vision seems to have been diluted truth be told i think is that fair enough john for yeah. a lot of people you hear you know you hear and we do work and even the good work it's not a sense that we still need to transform the whole system. So people shouldn't have to ask for self-directed support. It should be how the system behaves mm -hmm. that allows people to make those choices about their lives and how they want to be supported and mm -hmm. frees them up to use resources yeah. in a very different way and all of that. The system should be creating it. Inclusion Glasgow and Sol and organisations like that, Inclusion Glasgow, when it was set up, created a world where it was an environment that enabled that to happen for people that were being supported by that organization mm -hmm. and it's kind of thinking about how can the whole system so I think we still hold that really radical yeah vision yeah. I, I there's think, something think, that you mentioned oh sorry John come on I, I think the old power dynamics still pertain you know that uh, so when it comes to self-directed support the clue is really in the words isn't it it's about mm -hmm. people directing their own support with assistance from social workers and others etc uh, yeah. but what what instead you hear sometimes is uh, talk about people being in receipt of self-directed support <laughs> as, though, as though that as though that could even possibly be a thing yeah it's such a, and it's, such a a contradiction. it's the semantics around that isn't it it's the language yeah. that we use that really gives an insight into the underlying value base and the principles that we're working yeah. from and that second example that you gave there still remains under that um passive recipient of something that the service yeah. is providing rather than somebody that is truly in uh, as we use the term the driving seat of their own lives where actually the self-directed support is something that they naturally experience and what is provided from the lens of service is something that helps to um, hold that up and underpin that provide the resources to realize that but is not the only thing you know having mm -hmm. that much wider view mm -hmm. something that you mentioned both of you there that I'd, i just would love to know more about because you've been motivated to set up radical visions you've been motivated to do what you do as a result of your own passion and determination uh, holding a strong vision yourself around what good looks like but you mentioned that there were times in your life where you were introduced to some different ways of thinking some different ways of looking at things and I'd love to know what was what was that 
Yeah. What was the what were the areas that really got your attention that really started to resonate right. with you with regards to that absolutely makes sense and I just love to know where that came from and what it was and when that happens. Mm -hmm. mm. I think for, I think for me in the beginning it was pe some people. So I I qualified as a social worker as far back as the seventies, um, uh, but in the course of that, you know, I, I met some people that. Are, I found quite inspiring as people and um, just the, the way they went about their business in a, in a principled sort of way. I think the next thing that happened for me was uh, in the early 80s, I was a social worker in the community learning disability team and I got exposed to the, uh, the ideas of Wolfensberger. Uh, mm. and, I, yeah, I, I think that that was quite transformational because you, it, it made you think about what you were doing and what the wider service system was doing in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Turned things upside down, um, but also gave you sort of real kind of motivation in terms of the, the worth of the individual and the, despite all the kind of, you know, the criticisms leveled at him and we can't normalize everybody and blah blah blah. But you know the core the core stuff was about equality, I think. And um, yeah. yeah. He brought, didn't he, very much around recognizing that people couldn't possibly have a part to play in their community of any worth and value to yeah. themselves or anyone else if they were stuck yeah. in an institution. Yeah. And we don't you don't measure someone's worth of what they can bring to community based on academic accolades, but on just the, the more everyday elements of somebody in the life and what, what they can bring. And he really was the person that started to carve out the understanding of advocacy in the really early stages yeah. of advocacy. Um, so, yeah. Aye. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, he was very influential in my thinking as well. But I suppose it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's, when you ask that question, you think there probably are key moments, but it is a journey, isn't it? You know, like, mm -hmm. and I remember I started work as a nurse. And the minute I went into working in an institution, I knew that I needed, to, in fact, I had to force myself to continue to work in the institution because I knew that I needed to do that to do something better because you know it was like because it was so awful I remember being ill it was so awful do you know what I mean for me as a human being but if I just mm. gave up even at that point you think well if I give up and I don't go back then I'm not gonna and I didn't know very much about him at that point I was just a young lassie but I knew in my gut that something des was desperately wrong and then it takes years maybe to to build up some of that stuff and so there's key there's definitely key mo moments for me but right from the start it was like I need to do something about it and Wolfensberger's um work pass workshops I go I mean I, I was very very fortunate in lots of ways um but then I was a, probably quite <laughs> quite determined so I didn't you know I suppose I became a bit of a a driver for change and when I was even in that role within a uh, in nursing and health service and institutions and I came, became a clinical nurse specialist for rehab and started working with the voluntary sector and shutting the hospitals and stuff so but and I went I was lucky to be part of the person centre planning consortium that we there was we had mm -hmm. in Scotland with SHS and that was with a number of different providers. So it's interesting. So not a lot of providers were part of that, like couriers and different organizing. You don't necessarily see them having taken that learning and made the kind of transformational changes. And I worked at the time for the Richmond Fellowship and we were part of that consortium. But what I did then was try really hard. And that was, you know, even before inclusion to think about, well, how can we make this different? And we started... I started doing things in the organisation very different, working one person at a time and, you know, kind of really pushing the organisation and the boundaries of that organisation. But it wasn't until probably I met Simon and we had the beginnings of Inclusion Glasgow before I really understood that 
we had we had the opportunity to use the resources differently mm-hmm. and and for me that absolutely freed things up and I don't think I knew how to do that until I'd worked with Simon and I was in that I knew so much of what we needed to do I could do the planning and we could do this and we could think differently even about people living but actually I think that gave me much more of a whole picture once I was in the middle of doing that work. So it was absolutely key moments and I had lots of opportunities to do things like, I mean, pass for me was life changing. I remember coming about, out thinking that's changed my life. And I think what I worry about is where do people get those opportunities now? Mm-hmm. Where do they get those opportunities that we had to go somewhere for a number of days? And, you know, and, you know, Wolf, Wolfensberger's work, you know, a big part of it was for me and I was working in services was saying, are you, is this fit for purpose? You know, making you go and look and see what what people were having to, what their lives are like sitting beside them. I don't think, it, you mm-hmm. know, no matter how much I felt it, I don't think I'd ever sat for a whole day in somebody's mm-hmm. shoes beside mm-hmm. them. And so there was massive moments, but I think mm-hmm. I got the key to some of the solutions probably as I went along but massively when I when I got the opportunity to work with Simon in that different way and really think about how do we we've got ways that we can change the system and it's the system change that needs to happen it's not just the values and attitudes and power and all of that is part of that but the system itself needs is you know doesn't work the way it is you know so it needs to be different it needs to change and that was that was massive for me. So that I think we're still working on those same values and principles. I think, yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. I think then came deinstitutionalization for, and that's where we met around that process. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I'd been a bit protected from that because I'd worked in the borders, um, where there was like one psychiatric hospital, and even it was run on therapeutic community lines. Um, so it was only when I moved on to a job in, in the northeast of Scotland with a new organisation with a remit to bring people out of long-stay hospitals, as of course they, they were called, um, that I began to grapple with, with that. And also, I th- around about that time, the ideas of uh, supported living as developed by Peter Kinsella and others were really important. You know, the, the separation of housing from support really mm-hmm. is a very simple thing, but a very powerful thing. So mm-hmm. you have a right to your own home. We all do. And you have the right, independently of that, to be well supported if you have a disability. Or, so and not having those two things joined up or complicated, and you can only have a certain kind of support if you live in a certain kind of building and, and vice versa. So that that was quite radical for me. And mm-hmm. we started to try and put that into, into place in a kind of inadequate way, really, with the, the Lennox Castle closure programme. But we were trying to ensure that people weren't going to live in houses that were owned by support providers. And that they were, Absolutely. Yeah, mm. yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So th- we... For oh, people sorry. listening, uh, for people listening, I think it'd be really useful to mention you, you mentioned Simon quite a few times there, Francis, and he was has been still is very fundamental in driving new thinking forward and new ways of seeing things. And we're referring to Simon Duffy there, who um, uh, led on the Centre for Welfare Reform for a good number of years, and now is uh, putting his attention and focus into the citizen network and doing some really valuable work in that space. One of the things that for listeners as well that would be really interesting is going back to past. Now, I remember you, you took me back to my early, early, early days of working with five people that had moved out of a big institution and we used PASS. And I cannot remember for the life of me what it actually stands for. What does PASS stand for? Programme Analysis of Service Systems. Thank you. Thank you. John was a PASS instructor. John was a qualified (laughs) PASS instructor. So Mm -hmm. if he hadn't remembered that, there would be a wee... (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So that that, that that explains what you were saying, Francis, about you actually get in there and you're alongside people, and then yeah. you you're, you're experiencing what they're experiencing yeah. on a day to day basis oh. to determine how suitable it is. Yeah. Yeah. I remember spending uh, a, a day sitting beside a, a person in a care facility in Derbyshire somewhere, and it was the longest day of my life. I think just. Mm-hmm. And that was we need commissioners day. to be doing that now, don't we? Uh, we need them to yeah, be going absolutely. in and seeing, <laughs> absolutely experiencing. What is it that this person yeah. is actually? What does a day? You know, not, not even a like. day, but a few days. I well, think a few days you know, even even a, even a week. I don't you think know, it, I think what was interesting about Pat's, and this is a really interesting thing, isn't it? That there was there was something about the way that it was designed. So you went away from your normal place of work. And you stayed over in a odd place called Wigan or somewhere, you know. I don't think it was Wigan, but it was like I was, <laughs> we went down there. And so you stayed I, I, over. I got a nicer place. I got the Wirral. All right. And oh, Wigan was not nice, oh, but you so kind of nice. went to a hotel. You could have been anywhere, actually. But anyway, and <laughs> you got this kind of whole deconstruct process going on because they changed the whole language for everything. <laughs> that was something about I was sitting for a long time at the beginning thinking, you know, why are they doing this? Why are they why are they coming up with all these words? And but actually there was something I think about the process of stopping you thinking in the way that you do by changing the language. The, yeah, getting rid of around. service language, yeah. And then you kind of get are allowed to get into that other space where you actually started to understand what you were there to kind wow, of that's take really on helpful. board. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. but there was something about the whole process, and again, I just think there is lots of oh, people. You know, it worries me when I think about how many, how many. You know, you're asking when were you when were you like I've had a, a lot of light bulb moments. You know what I mean? And still do. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's and I've had so many opportunities to have that, and I don't know that mm-hmm. we've created those opportunities for mm-hmm. people. And so, how do we expect people? In those roles, those key roles and the roles of the frontline folk who are the most important folk who are in working every day and we're not investing any of this stuff for them to understand or think about or mm. think mm. about the, you know, yeah. The other thing we did, we went, we went on a study tour, didn't we, to America, you and I? Did. In our various we roles. to do that. We did. Mm. We did that. that was, do, you know really what was enlight- do, that. do you know what was really enlightening about that for me is... I was working at Inclusion, John. You were working at the time at Saul, weren't you? Was, and we went yeah. on the same sort of study tour, tour again with Peter Kinsella, who ran, mm-hmm. uh, what was it, the NDTI, was it? No. No, he's Paradigm. 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 Paradigm at the time. And we went across and we went and visited. But I suppose what that was really, really helpful for me to kind of think about, at that point, after that, I stopped looking for the Holy Grail. Mm-hmm. I realise because you can spend so long thinking somebody else has got this answer, somebody else knows they'll have done it, let's see and don't get me wrong, there's lots and lots of things you can learn from other people and take and you know maybe there's shortcuts but at the end of the day you've just got to go on with it and you've got to get mm-hmm. on with it and you're, the context of where you are and the organize, you know, it's an organisation or system that you're working in you've got to get on with it you yeah, can't keep yeah. searching for the holy grail and that's what that really taught me because I, I mean, there was some really good insights, but at the end of the day, I was like, that we just, you know, I came yeah. back saying, right, we've just got to, do, you know, we've yeah. got to do it. We can't keep thinking Learn somebody by else doing. Has got the answer. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's interesting. I just wanted, I wanted to pick up, both of you have used the same phrase in, in your kind of describing your early work and your motivations. You've talked about one person at a time. And I just wanted to pull that out and really highlight that because I think there's something in that that is really core to the doing things differently. Do you want to talk into that a little bit when you, when you describe in talking about working with one person at a time, particularly what you've just been saying, Francis, about, you know, there isn't a holy grail. We've just got to get on with it. So do you want to talk into that bit about the one person at a time um, idea? I suppose, um, yeah. I mean, as, as I said, even after going and doing a lot of the person-centered planning stuff, 
Um, the learning around that started off being about system. You know, can, you could use that as a system, a path, a map. It is actually a process, isn't it? And don't get me wrong, it's based on absolutely sound values that you have to understand and good facilitation skills that people, you know, really need to be um, be able to bring to the uh, the event. But it is that thing about it's not it's not the process itself again it's right back to the individual and when I the first time I met Simon and did a wee bit of work with Simon Duffy was when I was doing that training as part of a it was an ongoing it was an ongoing consortium and it was a a, a program over years I mean, we did it for years so you start off thinking I'm learning about maps and paths and you end up like realizing you're learning about oh the system's broken and we need to have a whole different system. And when I first went out and did my very first plan with Simon, um, we went in and after doing all this stuff about maths, paths and, you know, um, other tools, we went in and met this person and this person lived in a, a shared accommodation uh, and she was wanting to move out into her own home. And so the planning, the purpose of planning was about helping her think about what she wanted and what she needed. And then the, the reality was she had a really good friend in this house. And the biggest question she had was, should she go live with her friend or should she get a house that was just for her and work out how you have a relationship with a friend? And so Simon said, right, well, this is what we're going to do. We'll give her these, we'll, we'll create a menu for her and we'll... So nothing to do with a math or a path. It all went right out the window. <laughs> and it was very much about what is it we're doing here for this individual. And, and I suppose all the work that we did around inclusion and setting up that organisation was very much just thinking about one person at a time. People get confused, though. They think that means that, that you design individualised services that means that people live on their own. That's got nothing to do with it. It's about thinking about what that person needs, one person at a time, and then designing something. If you, if it's a service, or but it's more than a service. It's a, you know how do you then support them to get that life using the resources mm -hmm. they've got, and that includes the support arrangement around them. So yeah, one person at a time. We still work one person at a time, and a lot of the work we do. Um, but we have to influence the system as well because working Absolutely. one person at a time, I mean, you can see the benefits and you can see, you know, the, but it's not good enough um, because it, it, it should be that everybody gets access to that not living in institutions or in, in institutional ways. I don't know. Is that, is that, does that answer yeah, some of that? Right. I don't, yeah. John, do you want to say any more about that? I think it's also based on a sense of the well, the individual worth of the person, but also yeah. the individual kind of uh, experience of the person. So, I worked with a man uh, way back, uh, long before the deinstitutionalisation work. But uh, he told me a story. One that is uh, cut a long story short, he he'd been moved from pillar to post around Scotland uh, to suit his family, really, more than anything else. And he, he, he really talked about things like that. And one night he, he was getting out of the car and he said to me, uh, he, he was fond of telling the joke, he said, uh, do you know what happened if you if you took ill when, they were, when you were building the Great Wall of China? And I said, no, I don't, I don't know. I uh, don't know, Willie. Really, and I'm waiting for the punchline, he says, Oh, well, he says, they just built the damned wall over the top of you. And then he said, that's, I think, what happened to my life. Uh, oh, wow. Mm. Wow, so, that's so powerful. Yeah. And then he just toddled off into his house. Um, a week later, he told me the same story using the, the film 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. And so before then and after those two, as he never mentioned that again, but that was, so the individual experience is just so important and we have to treat each person as an equal adult citizen for working with adults and we can't 
allow any erosion of that concept. You know that it's well. You know, you the the pile them high and sell them cheap kind of commissioning approach, which classifies people because they share certain characteristics. It's just anathema. You know, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not human. It's not ethical. And I, so, yeah, that's. I think that's where where it comes from. And so, I think working one person at a time opens us up to lots of accusations. I think you're like, you're too slow. It costs too much. And and that's where you know we the radical bit uh, is like holding on to what you believe. You know, it's also not true. And that's it's when you true. say about forgetting history, because yeah. again, one of the things that Inclusion Glasgow set out to do was demonstrate that that's not true. Because we worked, as you you know, John, with very you know at the same time as other organisations were working with people in small group homes or you know and helping people mm -hmm. leave hospital. We were working one person at a time, mm -hmm. and the work that we did one person at a time was for the same amount of money. That was available yes. because it was a per capita. I know it's an awful way, but there was an amount of money that was available for each person leaving on average. Mm -hmm. um, and we made that work by thinking about each person individually and thinking about what would work and thinking about each person's situation individually. So if we had somebody, for example, which we did have who had extremely high needs, but actually they had a family that were saying, you know, why can why can this person not come and live with us? Then the work that we did at Inclusion was just to make that happen, not to think, well, you know, that's too difficult. And that included things like helping that family buy the right house and employ somebody they trusted as part of the arrangement. And that budget was tiny compared to other services where we had to put much more in because people didn't have those like you know life connections still and people wanting to be involved in their life in the same way so we had to really if you think about that that's where the economy can come of making it work so if you were just to look at that and that person's needs and say based on this person's needs you would probably need to spend this amount of money well actually you don't if you look at the person and what's around them, and all this love that's there, and you make some other choices about how you help and support that to happen, then actually you can, this person can be supported for a much less amount of money for, you know, for years to come or, or whatever. So that, end of it, and we did it. So we did it. We did it within mm -hmm. budgets. We did it quicker because people went to ordinary housing on the most, not special built, let's wait three years till that plans in place and this building's built and then they'll give us a few houses here as part of it or whatever. It it was ordinary housing right across across, across Glasgow. Um, and we, there was some support and help with that about getting the housing, but we took that up best, I think, working one mm -hmm. person at a time. And we started to take over. A lot of people were saying, oh, can you spoke at Inclusion Glasgow getting these folk out, you know? Um, <laughs> Because we were able to just, you know, do, you know, take advantage of some of those things in a way that other organisations couldn't do because they were trying to group, they were grouping people together. Mm -hmm. People in that, those days as well got so stuck. I mean, I worked in, before I came and worked at Inclusion with Richmond, I worked before that and, as I say, the health service with provider organisations helping people leave hospital, set up a lot of core and cluster type accommodation mm -hmm. and then that whole and this is what I meant probably about the idea of one person at a time and light bulb moments completely but people were very stuck in those systems and still are when they when they exist just now because they would you know you'd work with people they would get out and then they'd go well I would like my own home and folk would say well we're having to get the money because the contracts between the local authority and this provider and we haven't got money to give you to get to get your support arranged mm -hmm. in a different way and people would be stuck instead of being able to move on and get even if that had been a stepping stone from a hospital situation they should then have been able to move on when they had that opportunity to live their life in a different way and they couldn't mm -hmm. and when we brought the money together with the person yeah. and said this is your money 
you know, then and that a very individual way. If somebody, for example, and we did support for ex a couple to leave hospital, we've supported because it isn't about individualised, you must live in your own home. It's about listening to what people wanted. So we supported a couple to leave hospital and after probably a couple of years and we had two budgets and two teams. They lived in the same house. We had two had two budgets for those two individuals. And two, so we set it up in a way that allowed us to really think, continue to be sensible, think about each of them as individuals. Um, but also we needed to think about what worked in the relationship. And so it was complex, but it was the right thing to do. And then they decided they didn't want to be together any longer. So we just went in with them and worked out how do we, like you would in any other situation where somebody's relationship broke down, how do we, with you know as much tact and kindness as possible, work out who's doing what here, who's moving, where are they going, mm -hmm. how are we setting the pit? But we had budgets in place that belonged to that person. We had a team that belonged to that person. So really, the, the change was much more about the housing and mm. rather than all of those other things that you would be thinking about or having to go back and get more money or any of those things because we'd set mm. it up in that way right from the start. And so that mm. mechanism allows the freedom to, and it really can move with the person and shows that that's how it should be done. Um, so anyway, it, it's kind of... I'm, I've kind of gone off on a bit, of a, bit yeah. of a tangent, but I, th I think it shows the even when, because the easy bit would be to slip into something different in that situation, you know, to have one team of people or to, to not, I think that would have been the easy and probably default option for some organised, you know, for organisations, but it shows the difference yeah. later on of how, it, the, you know, that's, doing it that way really supported them to go on with their lives in the next step of their life, which is the other system was holding people back, holding them hostage basically in the system. You know, you can't move, no, we haven't got money, or, you know, we can't, there's no house, you know, there's nothing for you, you have to stay there. Or the other thing is then somebody moves and they just fill the place again with somebody else. Um, yeah. It's, it's interesting, I think the, the, the dynamic that you built into Inclusion Glasgow is it, it, really telling about having the principles and values congruent across all levels so we're not just talking about the principles and values at a leadership level as in this is where we're heading this is what we're doing the principles and values are directly there with any relational element from the organization to the person but the underpinning infrastructure that you've designed helps to support that position completely absolutely and sometimes what happens with transformational change is there's a fundamental change that happens. There's a re-emergence of a new way of doing things, changing the structures and the systems and the ways of relating. But it's done in such a way that that then becomes embedded. And 10 years, 20 years down the line, it's no longer fit for purpose. Whereas you designed something that was enduring. You designed something and it was set up in such a way that that intention could remain no matter what stage in the relationship with that person you had going into the future. So. It, it, the, the, it, the infrastructure that you had behind the delivery was really fundamental in staying true to purpose. Yeah, it was... and it, there's something there, Liz, about and um, something I used to repeat constantly and still do. So there's something about does the behaviour of the organisation reflect those values that it's talking about? So the behaviour of the organisation has to be congruent and reflect what we're yes. saying and quite often what you find is the values and uh, are, are clear here and people have you know um and i don't believe for a second people don't want to achieve those values but then they don't work out how to change the system their own organization in a way that actually allows them to behave in a way that supports those those values mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So they continue with systematic risk. And I have to say, it wasn't easy to stick to that. And I'm sure. So you would be sitting all, you know, in my experience of working at inclusion, that it was constant that you would be saying, oh, why are we doing that? Mm -hmm. Let's take it back and see, does that fit with what we say we're doing? We mm -hmm. do? do we, would we go and do that? No, I don't think so. So let's see what is the problem you're worried about or and let's see what our organisational response should be to that. 
-hmm. You know, let's not do a policy for everybody because somebody's got a a difficult situation. It's one Mm -hmm. person at a time. (laughs) Let's Mm -hmm. think about what we need to do for that person in that situation rather than create a policy for the whole, everybody that support that's supported by Inclusion Glasgow now must do blah. And it's it's that that or you know the or if organizations could think about that more mm-hmm. clearly, I think. I mean don't get me wrong, there'll always be some we all we need policies I mean, and then help. But but the how do you continue to be spell. that organization that stays mm-hmm. true to its values is just to think really hard about mm-hmm. what it is you put in place for yeah in those situations and when you say no we're not doing that I'm sorry yeah, it doesn't apply every day and actually we need to look at this person support this person work out what we do around this individual and not react in that mm-hmm. organizational way that you get forced to do and organizations are often forced to do it by all those external uh, influences that are constantly yeah. telling you you have to do this and have you got that and where's this and and I used mm-hmm. to say <laughs> probably not terribly you know, I used to feel if the care commission was coming in and asking us things, it was care commission, and then about why are we doing this and how are people, and you know, so, so I would be thinking, well, you know, we should be at the edge, they should be questioning us, you know, they should be uncomfortable maybe with some of the things we're doing, it, you know, I'm, as long as we're not, you know, in a, I'm not, I'm talking about a positive way, you know, you would be expecting them not to mm-hmm. necessarily at that time. You're talking 1996, that so, you know, when the the, the early two, 200s or whatever you'd be expecting them to be going this is a very strange organization you know how does that work you know how how yeah. are you, are your policies around that right and if you if you were just kind of well that you know people are expecting us to have a b c and d and we just did it then you move away from that individual organizational behavior so, uh, I, I always see that as an indicator that we're doing something different if <laughs> if it was business as usual, then questions wouldn't be raised. But if then questions are raised, that's a really good indicator that we're doing. And people say, oh, the care the commission have said, yeah. I'd be yeah. saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really good. That's a good sign that them questions being a. It's really it's good not... to hear kind of where you've been and your background and what you've done. But I would love to hear as More well what, what you're doing, doing right doing. now. So Radical mm. Visions, what do you do as an organisation? What kind of things are you involved in? Can I, can I just slip in one more thing before we do that that's been coming mm-hmm. to my mind? And it, 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 it's the influence, somebody who, who maybe they thought of as a more conservative figure, but I mean, he's no longer with us. But the, the work that Jim Mansell did in uh, articulating policy around people with challenging behaviour, I think was, was a big influence, big help to us in the deinstitutionalization process because it said good practice doesn't look any different really for this group of people. Uh, Good practice is community-based, it's individualized, it's it's thoughtful, it's detailed and uh, we were we were lucky enough in the commissioning process in deinstitutionalization to you know to be able to get some of his time and he came up and it it made respectable um, what we were we were saying should happen for some of the even within the institutional setup the most uh, stigmatized people you know that mm-hmm, yeah. wasn't okay just to be thinking well we should be designing some sort of unit for these yeah these folks. and and actually it's maybe mm-hmm. important to say that that in that process John very much the people that inclusion were asked to work with were the most challenging. So the, and we haven't talked about that, and it no. is, and it's a real issue because you don't want to be labelling and stigmatising people. But the reality was, mm-hmm. if you had lots of people who were moving out, uh, inclusion was there to do this very individualised mm-hmm. surface design, mm-hmm. and it was really the people that were saying, with their, you know, letting people know their behaviour that they weren't going to go live with lots of other people, or, uh, you know, they 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 just weren't going to be squeezed in to the next system. Um, so we ended up by default working with lots and lots of people who had those big reputations and we had to learn really quickly. So it wasn't for, this is the only way, to, this is about, oh yeah, it sounds like you're working with people who are really 
and that's what happens and again I don't want to really people that are really able or people that are really you know in this kind of um yeah we could, could see how you could do that if people were just all you know uh, much more able and had a voice and and were able to self-determine mm-hmm. that wasn't the case at all and actually we worked yeah. with some of the most challenging and uh, reputate people with the most challenging reputations at the time and showed how to do that in a way that was transformational and that's mm-hmm. what John's saying about forgetting our history as well yeah. because we keep talking about you know how awful and how difficult it is and but we've been doing this and have done it for years and people have been living a life for 20 years mm-hmm. that they would never have had or 25 years who had <laughs> those kind of reputations you know on their heads Mm-hmm. lean them down before they came you know they were able to get out and get a life um and get the right type of support to help them do that so it is yeah that's dead important though I think that's a really good point John to yeah, see it wasn't so, you know so, so to make a seamless uh yeah. switch to answer Liz, Liz's question yeah um I guess I guess a lot of what we do at the minute through our individual advocacy work is to get alongside some of the same folk with similar characteristics as back then who are still being told by the system, you know, you'll need to settle for this or we think you should live in this care facility or we don't allow individual choice so much in our area or whatever obstacle it is that that people face. Um, It is frustrating because you think, why have these lessons not been learned? Why, why do people have to come to people like Francis and I to get support for the argument that they should be included just in the way that everybody else is included and that their support should be uh, styled in such a way that it's, it's suitable to them as individuals, not to some uh, abstract theory about commissioning. So... Um, it's it's really it's really time consuming work. It's really worthwhile work. Uh, we get a lot from it, but uh, it does pose those questions about why are we why why do people not have these things now as of right and still mm-hmm. have to come looking for help to navigate these mainly attitudinal obstacles that they face. I don't mm-hmm. think they're really social work practice obstacles or no they're still systematic system system systematic so if I was if if we was to reframe the question to you which you started to explore and answer there with regards to it it's not necessarily attitudes it's systematic barriers there can be some attitudinal elements that actually influence this but why why are we still from your perspective from what you've learned and experienced why are we still in this position where that is just not the general condition of how people are supported why are people still having to fight to be able to live a life that makes sense to them um you're tempted to say that wolfensberger was right all along and that people are systematically devalued societally and you know, the, the, the social care systems that arise are themselves quite flawed because they, they reflect some of society's attitudes. So, and, I mean, that was part of his thesis, wasn't it? And um, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't say things, there's, you know, nothing's improved, nothing's better, but there's, no. I think there's still that underlying kind of disrespect for people with disabilities or... Mm. Um, within within society, which our services do mirror at times, um, so that mm-hmm. I think that's part of it. I think part of it is forgetting our history. So um, part of it is also not joining things up. So as people leave in the late in the nineties and two thousands in Scotland, and hospitals close, other people are going in the opposite direction. Um, into units and facilities for special people. And so the, no, nobody's joining those two processes up. And I'm still not sure that that, that happens. And we, you know, we had a 
the first policy for learning disability from the Scottish Parliament said these facilities should close, but it didn't say no one, no one should in future be admitted to similar places. Mm -hmm. so, it was, so, so there's a there's a collection of things there. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's quite... some focusing, <laughs> preventing people from actually ending up in these situations yeah. in yeah. the first place, rather than having this kind of feels a little bit like um, sounds quite crude, but a bit of a conveyor belt situation <laughs> where there's this real challenge to be alongside people and help them out of institutions and back into life that makes sense to them and just as that's been achieved and someone's able to get on with their life there's somebody else that's ending up in the spaces that's are just getting filled so yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean yeah. there's some fundamental things that could just happen we talk a lot about you know bringing people back home there's a lot of um, people obviously in these you know different kind of new institutions ATUs um, there's a lot of people in Scotland who are out of their area where they would normally live, their communities, where their families are, and there's lots of that conversation uh, that, that, that about how do we do that and how do we achieve that. So, And again, that's one of the things is we've forgotten that we've been doing it, and we've, we know how to do it, mm -hmm. and there's organisations and people who can support and help that process and and it, um but the other thing is, and I've completely forgotten what was my point was there. What was my what were you saying, John, before? What about you, people uh, going into units? Yeah. So as soon as people get out of units, hospitals, yeah. assessment so and treatment the, units. One of the yeah. things we see a lot about that, thank you for that, was you know, you could just make a decision not to send people out of area, not to put people so exactly what you're saying was like, why do we not it's that behaviour thing, isn't it? Why do we mm -hmm. not behave different? And if we agreed to some boundaries around that, then at least we would not continue to send people away. So we, you know, we we just we just repeat the same mistakes and errors, don't we? Really? Um, yeah. And, and at the root of that, actually, is what John was saying about the value of people. Yeah. Because if people were seen as equal citizens with value and the contribution to bring to their communities, it would be horrific to to even entertain the idea of, of shipping them off somewhere out of area to yeah, an institution yeah. where they're locked away from their community and all of their relational connections and all of the other things. Yeah. And and actually, yeah. th there is something in that about the value that is mm -hmm. um, attributed to people who need to draw on support in the yeah. first place. Um, so it's really interesting isn't it when you start peeling back the layers uh -huh. yeah. so much of it comes back to values and attitudes yeah. doesn't it yeah. um, so if you don't if, folk, if those fundamental values aren't shifted in in society and in people then yeah. it's almost like the system no matter what you try and do will continue to reboot itself mm -hmm. and it, it's almost but, like it you know no yeah. matter what you try and push there's a rebooting of oh well you know, so you can put out, I mean, self-directed support in Scotland, we've got really good, I think we really have to say this, we've got great re legislation. And yeah, I, I would be really upset if we didn't say that in the middle of this conversation. Mm -hmm. So there's a real positive place to start, real good legislative framework that is values driven and, you know, based. But it's really interesting how that doesn't, then uh, you know always well doesn't a lot of the time influence what actually happens in the ground for people in their lives when they're actually faced you know facing um a need for you know some help and support so mm -hmm. they're not asked about self-direct support you know or we don't do that here or mm -hmm. nobody talks about option two which is about you know so you get a kind of two so there's a whole a whole range of interpretations and quality of what people will face across the country instead mm -hmm. of, yeah. you know, and there's no way of holding the HSCPs and local authorities and people who are kind of responsible for making sure that people know about this and do their to account really about how are they meeting the, you know, the, the kind of the legislation. And interpret um, yeah, that's a really key thing, actually. Accountability, isn't it? Yes. Um, yes, it's the, it's the same with the Care Act legislation in England, actually, because um, yeah. it, the, the, it's quite weak. There's a lot of stuff in the statutory guidance 
uh, but local authorities have the opportunity to interpret it in their own exactly. local way. Exactly, exactly. Um, we spend a lot of time, least, Sarah, pointing people in the direction of the statutory guidance for self-directed yeah. support. And th that guidance contains legal duties and obligations, not just suggestions, yeah. you know, and, but mm -hmm. even, even that, you know, it helps us win the argument quite often, but one person the argument at a time. takes a long time. <laughs> Um, it's one person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One so of the we things that before, before we kind of bring the, the conversation to a close, because we've explored lots around where you've been, what you've experienced, what you, uh, you know, the, the way that you work alongside people and the values. And we've touched on there some of the areas that kind of get in the way of, of getting this good or getting it right. But you have been alongside people where it has worked and where mm. you have got people to a much better place in life where they are getting on with the life and, and living it yeah. <laughs> and so equally it'd be really good to hear from yourselves the conditions that that enable that to happen what yeah. you know what what has been in place that's really helped to create that yeah. pivot from being institutionalized and serviced to getting on with life yeah. and, and just living it so yeah Maybe, we, maybe if I say some of the, what I think some of the ingredients are, maybe Francis could ex, ex, give an example of how that's worked. So, uh, so the, the advocacy is really important. And we, we, are, we are newcomers to advocacy in some ways, you know, we're, but we're, we're learning, we're, we're knowledgeable, I think. So that helps. We know what the act says, we know what the guidance says. We've got this history of working uh, and having all these, you know, important we, principles in our head so the ad, you do need to kind of be willing to take the fight on but alongside that I think what we also bring is a sense that okay if we win this argument if we, if we achieve you know a, a position where there's a budget and there's there's a you know there's a way forward we'll also work out with you what the plan might look like so how are you going to get the most out of that budget and in, in the most creative kind of person-centered way. So it's advocacy plus that uh, mm -hmm. creativity and so solution focus. Um, yeah. So when you refer to advocacy plus as radical visions and you two, so you're referring to that. That's what advocacy yes. plus looks like. It's having uh, the background understanding, uh, understanding yeah. the legislation, understanding people's rights, but then also doing that element of, well, this is how this is how it could yeah. happen. And it you're is. in the driving seat of your plan, and this is how it, how this and, can happen. For you. And our feeling was that those two things didn't often come together. Yes, yeah. So it's, yeah. That, we think that. Yeah, absolutely. So like, a big part of the problem is people get stuck with each other. And, and if people haven't had an opportunity to really think about what they would want, what self-directed support means, how they can use that, um, do the, you know think about a plan their outcomes for a life who's all of the stuff around a planning process then they're much less in control of any kind of way forward because they don't they're not able to say this is what I want and this is why and this is why it makes sense to me and this is why when you look reflect on the um the legislation the legislation should enable me to have it mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so if it's using the money for something very creative and different, then what's the difference between me saying I would want that compared to somebody else? And if I can demonstrate that through the good planning and clarity around how I would use the money and how I would be, then obviously I'm going to be in a much, much stronger place to have mm -hmm. those conversations with yeah. social work. I think it's really important that we do a couple of things though before we talk any more about Advocacy Plus um, because we don't do that on our own. We do that as part of a, a group of organisations. So In Control Scotland still part of that uh, work that we do with Advocacy Plus and another organisation called Civil Rights First. And that's a, a, a woman who, well, she's now got some other folk joined her, but um, and for a while she was a one man, a one woman band. Uh, and that's very much an organisation that's focusing on the legal human rights position for people. And that's that's strong. 
in terms of the advocacy. So it really is bringing that. I know we talk a lot, people talk a lot about human rights and basing things on human rights, but I think it changes the dynamic having somebody with that kind of legal background and perspective mm-hmm. on board and acting on the person's behalf. Really interesting how it changes the feel and dynamic, power mm-hmm. dynamic. I don't know all of those things John's talking about. Oh, you've got a lawyer, basically, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she doesn't practice law, but she is a trained lawyer, um, trained in law. And um, so that's really powerful. I mean, do the work between us depends on, on what kind of uh, work we do. I think it's also important to say that's not all we do. And we're not funded for that. We are occasionally funded by individual, say, organisations um, that enable who we do other work, consultancy work for. They would maybe ask us to do a particular piece of work and we'd fund that around uh, Advocacy Plus. Um, but we've never managed to quite get any funding directly for it um, as a project. Mm. We're still looking and we, we will <laughs> keep looking. So a lot of it's pro bono. So we do a lot of the other work we do, which is, a, and, you know, we, we're still passionate about all of that, working with organisations, you know, working with things like, you know, uh, study groups from uh, Slo- Slovenia. Slovenia, right? that's okay. right, yeah, well done. Uh, who, are, who are thinking about how to shut institutions or, you know, there's a whole load of variety because we've just talked about people and there's a whole variety of stuff that we do. Uh, you, we want to change the system and influence the system by our learning. And we find mm-hmm. try and find ways to do that. So yesterday we were up meeting with a local authority who, after a piece of very indi- individual work, are very interested in how we've managed to achieve the kind of different way of thinking and are interested in maybe how we would help their, their local authority. So some of that small individual work does lead to, to more systemic yeah. impact change if we can and that's what we obviously want to do we also run a festival every year called we are one um again that's kind of not well we've got some funding last year actually for that so we have some funding at different points for that so we have two when is the when is the next festival happening francis because we came along to was it the first one that we came to and we did yeah. the big graphic wall and yeah yeah, yeah. when is the next one happening we were yeah. uh, yes, it's not there's no definite date it's july of this year was being uh, uh-huh. suggested at our last meeting. So watch this space. Uh-huh. We need to yeah. So if people are well. interested in that, how, how would they find out more information? Where, where should they look for a detail of that? They, well, I think the Citizen Network site would probably contain the first news of that. Uh, our own website is there, but it's, it's, it's a bit more static. It doesn't so much reflect uh, like news or latest developments kind of thing so probably the citizen yeah. network bit under under uh hmm. citizenship fest i can't remember what yeah. the heading would be Citizen yeah. Fest. Yeah. Citizen okay. fest. Citizen yeah, fest, yeah. which was francis yeah. francis came up with that term way back yeah mm-hmm. fantastic and you, uh, you've re- you've actually written um publications as well haven't you all around um uh, finding your way home is that the right title yeah. and the advocacy book? where would people find that information then if they're interested in finding out more about that if you go to our website um mm-hmm. and go to the publications section of our website um i don't we're able to stick the details on at the end of the Oh, uh, fantastic yes yeah, so we can we can so, put, add the uh, link to your website yes. on the comment section yes. on the on youtube yes. so if you was we, we, as you know we have one question that we ask guests that our previous guest um but before yeah. we go on to that if there was somebody who was coming into um getting involved in doing advocacy getting involved in facilitating person center plans just being alongside people and and do it being part of that journey to get into the life that they want to have. What would be your nugget of wisdom to give people? Well, I think I think I think you need to be humble. I think you need to. When I did my social work, training, <laughs> so, so how long ago it was, but uh, there was a guy. The principles of social work were articulated by this guy called Bistek. I don't, you'll, some mm-hmm. people remember that, but there was one thing that always stuck uh, stuck with me there, and it was uh, 
The role of the social worker is to follow the demands of the client task in the vertical. So you're not there to impose a solution or, you know, and that's difficult sometimes because oh, we've dealt with this mm -hmm. kind of situation before, we know what to advise, etc. It's it's actually getting alongside a particular individual, a particular family, being quite humble about that and, and following the story that they're telling you and, and where they want to go with that story. And obviously offering advice and ideas, etc. But um, yeah, you ju you're just sort of there to give of yourself and facilitate a process, I think. Fantastic. Thank you, John. What about for yourself, Francis? I suppose I would just think that... I think my biggest thing would be trust your gut feeling about things and don't give up. So things mm -hmm. can be tough, and I think... The biggest, you know, if you were kind of coming into this work, it's like not walking out and that, you know, not walking out when things are tough. It's about bedding in and and really thinking about um, what's possible and believing in that regardless of where you're at. You know, it's like you've got to believe that. And I think for most of us, we will have I always show this slide and it's Tibetan monks climbing this set of stairs that go forever, never, never. <laughs> and it's like it's something that, you know, belief is, <laughs> is uh, that you knowing that you will reach your goal without seeing the end, knowing that you, you know, that kind of knowing that you will get there and that it's possible. And um, yeah, I mean, we've got some amazing stories, examples. We do a lot of, you know, this work. Um, we probably need to share those more so that people can really continue to see what is possible and what, you know, some of those um, examples of where people, you know, have made massive kind of changes to their life by quite small sometimes differences in the way that maybe they're uh, mm -hmm. being, uh, being allowed to mm -hmm. use the resources that are available to them and think differently and whatever. and. Um, so we, we will we will just focus more about on persistence. That. Yeah, there's uh, persistence there, isn't it? You have to kind of just stick at it. And uh, mm -hmm. Nietzsche, of all people, has a quote something like, uh, "What's demanded of you is a, uh, a long obedience in the same direction." <laughs> so, that's, that's, find, I suppose the other thing is find like-minded people. There's nothing yeah. more important than having the people around you, finding those people around you that think the same, you know, that you know are sharing those values with you in your gut. And you know that even if you don't have the answers, you'll work them out together. And it's much, much better working things out together because it's too hard to think you can work it all out on your own or that you've mm -hmm. somehow got the answer um, mm -hmm. in any situation, really. So, yeah, working alongside Fantastic. other people, like mind people, people that challenge you don't think you've ever got to the point where you've got all the answers or else if you have maybe time to retire mm -hmm. yeah yeah well, thank you so much so are you ready for the the question so the the last person we did a vlog with was a lady called jules casey jules has dedicated the last three uh, years of her life to building an approach and a program called be humankind but uh, previous to that, she was really fundamental, very similar to yourselves in being at the forefront of hospital closure, helping people to get back into life in community. And, and one, was one of the main founders of uh, In Control as part of the role that she had at Mencap at the time. So what Jules recognised, and that this is why she built the programme, when we asked her the question around... Uh, what are the what are the barriers what gets in the way and she said it's not what you do it's the way we are with each other in the pursuance of that and actually it's about the relationships of everybody involved mm -hmm. and if them relationships can be healthier built on trust and kindness we're probably more likely to get to 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 the pursuance and, and the end you know what we the vision of what we all hold so, so 
she's built be humankind check it out it's fantastic it's it's really it's a great program but uh, clearly her her question that she asked is framed around that principle of of kindness and sarah do you have the question to hand there yeah so jules asks how kind are you to yourself and others and what would you like to change about it it's a bit of an ouchy one i mean the <laughs> temptation is to say yes i'm wonderful <laughs> mm. uh, how kind are you to yourself and others and what would you like to change about it? So um, yeah. I'm aware we're quite short on time now, so yeah. we'll okay. keep it brief. I, I think we're quite hard on ourselves. Uh, we could be kinder to ourselves, I think. Um, I think we're quite kind in relation to the people who are needing our help. I think, speaking personally, maybe I'm a bit less kind when it comes to dealings with some professionals who I think should know better and that maybe you know that that's I don't know I'm, I've, I've got mixed feelings about that because it, it it sustains the drive that they should know better but at the same time they are caught up in a system very often that they find hard to mm. and I would you know. say you're probably right I think that we are trying to be better at being kind to ourselves I think yeah. that's a journey that we and we talk about. It. It's on our, it's on, we, it's in our conversation. So I think that's yes. good. Mm -hmm. Um, oh. might not always, you know, get to where we're going with it because we we are driven and things happen and we, but we talk about it and we're focusing more on it. And yeah, I think that's good. But and I think you're absolutely right. It's really difficult in the middle of situations not to start to take to be um feel the just like you do with your gut, feel angry about the situation that people are in or the stance that people are taking. And I think more and more um, as I get older and more and more as I'm around people who are kinder <laughs> and understanding, you, you know, and having worked in systems ourselves, you just, it is really, I suppose it's enlightening and to, to keep trying to think about how do you behave differently around that with your own feelings? How do you manage those feelings and actually take yourself out of that and remember that people are, you know, people. And actually most people want to do a good job. Most people do care about other folk. If you know, so part of our role, I think a lot of the, diff the stuff we do do is about helping people uh, think about how they learn through the experiences that we work together and how they're involved rather than that they're somehow the enemy <laughs> and sitting on another side, you know. So I think Advocacy Plus is really good at doing that where it can, you know, really good at trying not to be adversarial and to bring people along and to give people opportunities to think differently or um, remembering where they're at in terms of the systems they work in and, what, you know, all of that. So... Yeah, I think we're getting better at it through that work, probably. Yeah. Than, than yeah. We were. When we started Radical Visions, we're probably angry. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you're putting people back in institutions and not having it? <laughs> now we're kind of, right, okay, maybe that's not a good approach. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the anger then, is a catalyst, isn't it? For, yeah, for stuff yeah, to yeah. start happening. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. one of the things that's really interesting that um I think really fits into what you're talking about there, Francis and John, is an element of the Be Human Kind program that talks about courageous um leadership, but how kindness is a foundation stone to courageous leadership. So that thing of shifting shifting sands or shifting huge heavy stones um, yeah. and actually having kindness as a foundation so that it really is where you begin to see some of that change happening so we always ask our guests to think of a question for our yeah. next guest so we wondered if you had a question that we could take to our next guest yeah here's a question uh, what if anything still surprises you in the course of your work and what provokes your curiosity? Oh, I like that. that question. That's that's a really good question. That's thank great. you, John. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, your insight, your wisdom. Um, <laughs> that I would love to hear more of the story. So you mentioned earlier on in the conversation mm -hmm. that getting into the space where you can start to share some of them stories. I'd love to 
read and hear and see more of, of what you've done. And I think that that is a real avenue to infect and affect change, mm-hmm. you know, because yeah. we relate to stories. People yeah. can see it, understand it, um, and know what space they can hold within that change in the future as yeah. well because it, it gives people an idea of what it looks like and what is possible yeah. I'll, um, I'll finish just to finish on a humorous note Liz on, on that I, I was doing a bit of work recently and I visited a woman who had never met before and towards the end of the the meeting I said to her well thank you very much for for uh, sharing your story and she said to me I didn't make it up John <laughs> Oh. <laughs> uh, and I quickly, quickly said, "Oh no, I meant your life story, etc." You know, it's just a, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, we, we, we do not a fictional to, one. Yeah, not a fictional story, but real, a real, real story. story. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, yeah. And it, it is one thing that we are exploring at the moment ourselves, and I think the one thing that we we really want to make sure is that it's the voice of the person that we hear in the story share so that the you know that it's their story they own it they share it and and the emphasis on that it being quite a key key part of that so thank you so much for your time you. we, we will thank have you. this up on the youtube thank channel you and share it with you and uh, I'm sure people enjoy listening to what you've had to share. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank thanks you. to you both. It's been really great to chat to you. I could talk to you for hours. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> but what, what we'll do um, when it's up on the YouTube channel, we'll share in the notes under the, the video your website address and links to the publications that you've shared and, and things like that. Uh, and also for our Imagineer followers, uh, the usual plug about our website, our social media platforms, our mailing list, uh, and all the different ways that you can reach us and see our resources and find out about what we're doing. So we'll include a link tree link uh, in this show's um, notes um, and all of that stuff will be in one link for, for a change so we're not putting loads and loads and loads of stuff in the notes underneath yeah. Um, but yeah we'd love for you to to share that if you found this episode helpful share it with people on your own social media we want these conversations to spread <laughs> we want people to be talking about this stuff um, so please share it far and wide with anybody who would find it interesting and if you'd like to be involved in a future conversation with us on this vlog please get in touch with us um, and let us know about your ideas about what you'd like to talk about because we're always interested in talking to guests with new things to share, uh, especially if it's in in the field of self-directed support and community generally. We're really interested in hearing about that. So um, thank you very much and uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next episode. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.